early game, bird wyverns are a staple of Monster Hunter, often being an amateur's first real challenge. Their relative lack of threat, garish colours and often clumsy behaviour can give them the reputation of being dim-witted or simple. They are clowns of the Monster Hunter world. But really, several bird wyverns show a suite of behaviours that actually suggest great cognitive function. And rather, I believe that they may well be the smartest of the wyverns at least and are possibly brainier than most of the overall monster roster too. For today, we'll be looking at everyone's favourite mimic, Kurapiko, the egg thief extraordinaire, Kuleyaku, and the greatest actor of the wyverns, Gypsaros. So let's dive right in. So let's start with Kurapiko, and his most obvious attribute of being a very skilled mimic. Kurapiko chiefly uses this in his fight to summon other monsters when it's under attack, making its escape while the hunter is distracted with a new opponent. But obviously it didn't evolve this unique vocal ability just for humans, and Kurapiko's ecology video also shows him using it to scare off a small pack of jaggy, stealing all the fish that he'd mentally claimed. So Kurapiko fakes the calls of other monsters for personal gain, but how else can this behaviour be used in both other situations and for long and short term impacts? A few species of bird already engage in similar behaviours to this. For one, fork-tailed drongos will mimic the alarm calls of other species to steal food that they've already caught. When they see other animals like birds or meerkats handling food, they produce their own or imitate someone else's alarm call so that they flee and the food can be stolen. The drongos also somewhat earn their keep by also making sincere alarm calls when the moment calls for it. But overall this shows a deceptive use of mimicry to attain resources. In their ecology video, it's the Kurapiko scaring off the Jaggies, but it's not unreasonable to assume if Kurapiko found a group of Jaggy already at a kill, or a feeding spot it wanted to appropriate, it would pull the same trick. Overall, the calls of other animals, be it the call of a threat or an alarm call that warns of it, aren't things you can afford to ignore. You may lose out on some resources, but that's still better than potentially being eaten. As well as normal resources, such tactics can be used for self-defence. Brown thornbills are small passerines who aren't exactly Olympian in their physical prowess, which can leave them potentially vulnerable to predation when young and less mobile especially. When attacked by a nest-raiding predator, pied currawongs, the adults mimic the alarm calls of other birds when they see a predator. As corvids, pied currawongs are only meso-predators. They're still vulnerable to attack themselves from true birds of prey. As such, upon hearing the mimicked call, it's in their best interest to also flee or at least halt their foraging to check for danger, giving the nestlings a chance to escape. It's interesting to speculate that this may actually be what Kurapiko's first intention is when attacked by a hunter. It may not be deliberately summoning another monster, but rather trying to trick the hunter into thinking there's something more dangerous nearby in the hopes that they'll also flee. The resulting monster that shows up is more of a factor that every monster Kurapiko can call is a predator that's hostile to others of its own kind or is just generally massively territorial, and so it rushes over to confront what it perceives to be an intruder. This is something certain types of jays have been seen to do as well. Both of those studies dealt more directly with birds that mimic alarm calls. Whilst they have the same direct function as what Kurapiko may intend with its own mimicry, Kurapiko is chiefly known for its ability to imitate the roars and other calls of large predatory or aggressive wyverns. This is more rare, but it is also seen in nature too. Jays mimic the calls of their main predator, red-shouldered hawks. These aren't done at random, but seem to be done more frequently by females in mated pairs at the start of the breeding season. It's suggested that this is done to put other jays off approaching their nest site. If you're constantly alarm calling and convincing everyone your patch is a predator-filled killing field, it's not going to be viewed as good real estate to build a nest and rear chicks on. Whilst Kurapiko, in the context of the fight, uses his mimicry to attack or intimidate, it's possible this could be a cause for them to learn predator calls. The root of it may not be to scare hunters or other monsters, but other Kurapiko. As ground nesters like most of the wyverns, a good spot is worth fighting for as it can drastically increase chances of nesting success. And Kurapiko may learn so many calls for better success in putting other individuals off their nesting patch. Now in regards to intelligence, it varies. Vocal mimicry is quite common in birds, but it's often used inappropriately, which is to say that the call copied doesn't match the scenario of its normal use. Birds will often just repeat them to add to their own songs, or because they mimic sounds they heard in adolescence, or various other theories. To actually use mimicry strategically requires cognition. If we use the excellent definition of cognition from Seyfarth and Cheney 1992, 
and combine it too with a great summary of certain types of vocal mimicry from Goodale and Kagama. And it becomes clear that using sound in this way isn't just something any dimwit can do. There's a lot of processing and adaptation to be done. It's also made clear in the opening of Kurupiko's first quest that just any loud noise won't displace larger predators. So a Kurupiko has to know its opponent, what call to use from its roster, which also depends on its environment. In summary, Kurupiko is likely very smart. So what about the rest of his behaviour and ecology? Kurupiko has quite a generalised build overall, but with a long bill with sharp thin teeth and semi-palmate feet. We see this in birds like herons and plovers, among others, and it makes sense. Kurupiko likes fish, and as such him living in the Moga archipelago and the flooded forests makes sense in this regard. But the sandy plains somewhat less so. But deserts can still be huge draws to waders so long as there is some water. The lagoons and estuarine salt pans surrounding Walvis Bay in arid desolate Namibia are often regarded as one of the most important bird habitats in southern Africa, and absolutely teem with waders and other waterfowl, especially around migration time. Sconova the Carnotaurus suggested that the inland deserts may have been created by the retreat of an ancient sea, and if this is the case it could explain how Kurupiko wound up in such areas to start with. Inland arid savannas and deserts like the sandy plains often have rivers or seasonal pools too, and these fill up with fish and frogs that become trapped when the wet season ends. It's not uncommon to see huge amounts of wading birds gathering to feast on the trapped fish as the dry season sets in in the African savannas. Being a brainy bird, Kurupiko likely gather at these seasonal fish traps too. Said savannas have no shortage of waders, and a lot of them are good opportunists too. While some waders are dependent on water, like spoonbills, whilst others require only mud, and a great many can almost be water independent. But if they aren't eating fish, what else is there for these waders, and Kurupiko as well, to eat? The marabou stork is Africa's largest and perhaps most terrestrial stork, and it isn't picky often eating anything it can and as such is quite happy to take carrion. The Monster Hunter fanbase often associates Kurupiko and Devil Joe, with the former being famous in third gen for calling in the latter before his actual event quest, giving players a terrifying new experience. But it could be possible Kurupiko associates with Devil Joe in particular to scavenge his kills. As said in his video, Devil Joe likely has a relatively weak bite and is poorly adapted to consume bone so he may leave a lot of scraps left on his kill for the small Kurupiko to eat. This association may be unique to Devil Joe, as flying wyverns are probably avoided due to the risk of predation, and Tigrex, Anjanath, and possibly Glavinus can probably eat kills in their entirety. Another particular marabou favourite is anything living small enough to be swallowed whole. This may also be the case for Kurupiko too. His good eyesight and quick reflexes likely mean that he can snare lizards and small mammals with ease but it's possible he may have another cunning trick up his sleeve, or rather worn on them, his flints. Various species of raptor in northern Australia have been seen to spread bushfires, locating already existing ones and then picking up burning brands to drop them in unburnt areas across roads or waterways to continue the fire. As the fire spreads, it flushes reptiles and insects that can then be easily picked off. This may well be what the flints on its wings are used for, Kurupiko likely starts fires in the dry seasons of arid savannas, and then patrols along the fire line picking off small fleeing animals. Indeed, his first quest in Tri is named Playing With Fire, and references this. With so many fire-breathing animals, the savannas and grasslands of Monster Hunter must also have a fascinating guild of plants and ecological succession with such regular wildfires. But what about Crimson Kurupiko? Being found more in the flooded forest, they likely have more of a typical wader ecology in the swamps and streams. Unable to effectively produce wildfires to forage with in such a damp environment, the Kurupiko uses its flints as an anti-predator mechanism, using their noisy clacks and bright flashes to startle other monsters. Finally, its absolutely resplendent coloration may also have a double use. Parrots have a synthetic pigment in their red feathers called cicato vulvins which allow them to resist bacterial degradation. Their brilliant plumage may be an adaptation to the humid, damp environment of the flooded forest that will obviously be rife with fungi and bacteria. This is something normal Kurupiko who live in drier environments likely don't have to worry about. There is probably some spillover between the populations at various locations, and it's also pretty cute to imagine a pair formed between a normal and crimson Kurupiko rearing a brood of watermelon-coloured chicks. 
Speaking of chicks, Kuropiko's habit of spitting corrosive bile is likely a vestigial trait just hung on to for adulthood. Fulmars are a type of seabird that produce a unique stomach oil that they can spray at attackers when accosted. This is very smelly and incredibly sticky, to the point of being near impossible to wash out. There are records of raptors as mighty as sea eagles being compromised as a result of being oiled as the feathers lose their water-resistant qualities, which can obviously be fatal to a bird so frequently in contact with water. Kuropiko may form something similar, albeit with some form of modified stomach acid. Without feathers, most potential Kuropiko predators won't be too phased by oil, and the substance does cause defence down, suggesting it's corrosive. Any wyvern or even elder dragon that gets it in its eyes, nose or mouth would likely be in great pain, or potentially even blinded. Considering wyverns as a whole likely had small origins, it's likely the form of fire breathing was an adaptation of something like a fulmar chick's defences. Something that began as an anti-predator defence for the young, but was co-opted into a permanent adult feature of competitive interactions. For things like Spec Evo, I've always considered it as the most reasonable basis for a breath attack too. In terms of overall appearance, Kuropiko may be the most basal of the bird wyverns too. If you take away the flints and musical organs, I imagine it's what the common ancestor looked like for most other species several million years ago. Another wyvern fond of wetland habitats is Gypsaros. Gypsaros has a suite of anti-predator mechanisms. Its flash crest to blind attackers, great stamina to flee, venomous secretions, an elastic hide so it can still turn and retaliate, but most prevalently, it will play dead. In an extensive review of tonic immobility, which is the technical term for playing dead, the authors mention that this is something the animal will keep up despite predator presence. This is something Gypsaros doesn't do. Rather, if anything, Gypsaros waits for the hunter to come closer before attacking further. It seems pretty clear from this that it isn't an automatic, innate response from Gypsaros, but rather something that's planned. So it actually seems Gypsaros has the cognitive ability to set some form of trap. This sort of behaviour is very hard to both qualify and quantify in the natural world, as a lot of instances of it may just be lucky coincidences. But for Gypsaros at least, it's quite clear this is a very deliberate move to sucker punch its opponent. The primary predator of Gypsaros is Nursilla, the large carnivorous Temneseron. Neither monster is particularly large, and a flailing, biting, kicking Gypsaros could potentially break a limb if not properly restrained. Some spiders also have eyes that are very sensitive to light, specifically creating and destroying specific membranes for nocturnal hunting. A well-timed flash could potentially cripple a Nursilla's vision for a whole 24-hour period. Gypsaros is probably so laden with anti-predator defences because he's a wyvern caught between a rock and a hard place. Rathian and Rathalos will nest in wetlands, but it also can't seek refuge in caves due to Nursilla and Kizu. It can blind other wyverns and Nursilla, but not Kizu, so it needs a thunder-resistant hide to prevent being stunned. Great stamina and venom are useful no matter what's attacking you. Rathalos and Rathian are both diurnal, but Kezu and Nursilla are likely nocturnal, so there are no real refuges in either time or space for Gypsaros in its habitat, so it needs to be permanently on guard. Gypsaros will also steal things. Whilst this leads to a comparison with the cultural view of magpies, being thieves of shiny things, this isn't actually supported by research. But corvids overall are thieves who love taking random objects, and this is suggested to be related to tool use. Ravens, jackdaws, and New Caledonian crows will cache novel objects that aren't edible. Although as of right now, it still seems unknown why the birds do this. One theory is that they're caching such items for further use as tools. New Caledonian crows prefer stick-like items that can be used to help them forage after all. It's been suggested that ravens use these as decoys, caching them as fakes to test the ability of other ravens to find their real food caches. So overall, it's quite hard to really conclusively say why Gypsaros is a thief, but it's worth noting how little we actually know about Gypsaros. We know a lot about what's constantly trying to eat it, but almost nothing about what it eats, or why it seems to select for wetland habitats. But we can try and infer such things from its morphology. Gypsaros's overall head seems reminiscent of oviraptorid dinosaurs, and it has quite a weird mouth. Oviraptors have undergone many changes of hands as to what their mouths may have been adapted to, but to compile some of the more recent papers, it seems that they were likely generalist omnivores, eating small prey whenever they could grab it, but a lot of its diet being vegetation, with good numbers of tough material like fruit and nuts. We can't take a direct look at Gypsaros's skull and musculature, but it seems adapted to crush reasonably well, 
with its short beak and plate-like teeth. So maybe it's a bit of a generalist, crunching up bits of anything small enough that it can eat in the wetlands. It's also described as destroying crops in the first game Guild Quest, so it's quite possible that it may actually eat some plant matter too, like fruits, nuts or grains. It may be mollusks or something similar that draw them to the wetlands. Large freshwater mussels or juvenile cenotaurs could form a large chunk of the diet. It's likely quite deliberate that Gypsaros resembles an oviraptor, as interestingly the original idea for Gypsaros was indeed to be an egg thief. This is what it's referred to as in the original art book. No doubt it flashed the parents, then quickly devoured the nest before fleeing. So it's interesting that these two traits were then sequestered into Kula and Sitsuyaku in World. Their monster hunter team never seemed to throw away an idea. The serpentine crocodile being captured by a plesioth looks a lot like a leviathan. Their early concept for Nakarkos in 4th gen and Valhazak in 5th gen both come from concept art from the very first game too. This brings us neatly to Kula Yaku himself. Kula is perhaps most mocked for his stupidity, but he shows a very key indicator of intelligence, tool use. This behaviour is seen in a lot of species and is always a point of discussion among those studying animal cognition, as it's quite hard to specify what counts as a tool and how relevant tool use is to intelligence and cognition. A very rough definition can be taken as the manipulation of an external object used as an extension of the body to alter the condition, form or position of another object, organism or the user. So just using your static environment doesn't count. So scratching yourself on a tree isn't tool use. But breaking off a branch to scratch an unreachable part of yourself would be. Tool use may sound unimpressive or irrelevant to a lot of people, but that's because humans are obligate tool users. You're using one right now to watch this video, and we use multiple different tools every day of our lives and couldn't survive without them, even probably in our paleolithic forms. Using a tool as an extension of your body requires your brain to update its external map of the body shape for it to be used efficiently, and this requires a whole new network of neural pathways. Kulayaku's tool use is also flexible and selective, further degrees for intelligence. Some animals may use tools innately, as a hardwired trait that doesn't require cognition to activate, but only as an automatic response to an external stimuli. Kula only selects certain large rocks to defend itself, not just picking up any round object or clod of earth, showing that it is selective about the substrate it uses as its shield due to having knowledge of the physical properties. Kula is curious about other round objects, but will reject them if they don't fit the physical bill. It also doesn't just use them constantly, and modifies its behaviour by fleeing once they've been broken or dropped. Tool use shows creativity and adaptivity, responding to novel circumstances with new behaviours. This innovation is what can really lead to intelligence, so it's quite fair in my opinion to view Kula as big brain. What about the rest of his ecology though? The other most interesting thing about Kula is that he's an ovivore, or egg eater. This is quite a rare feeding trait, and one that also suggests that Kula may have further use for intelligence. While such behaviour is typically seen in low metabolism animals like lizards and snakes that also eat other items, Kula is a large active animal that has to find a certain amount of egg mass per day. This will no doubt require an extensive knowledge of both its territory and who lives in it. If they're breeding, how will they react, their activity patterns, and so on. I do feel Kula has to occasionally eat other things like shepherd hares, lizards, and carrion, but this still suggests to me that Kula live at quite low densities despite being viewed as a starter monster. The resources they depend on are quite rare, and will require large, well-stocked territories to sustain themselves. Indeed, even egg eating is a learned behaviour, and the art book notes that young Kula will often break the egg on the ground and have the more awkward job lapping it up and that experienced Kula will often just eat the more energy-rich yolk over the lean protein albumin. The World Art Book also states that they're primarily an arid land species with small populations in wetter areas, like the coastal forests of the New World, where a major food source is interestingly Jagras eggs. This preference for dry areas may also be an influence of Rathalos being present to defend nests outside of arid areas like the Sandy Plains or Wild Spire Waste. Apsaros and Renoplos both lay quite large eggs, and good amounts of them too, so it could be that these large herbivores just provide the best eggs to steal. Aptonoth also likely lay eggs, but maybe they have more small eggs that are less profitable, or are more seasonal breeders. Evolutionarily, this likely stemmed from being a predator of nestling animals. Research on egg-eating snakes has found that this trait is derived from snakes that used to eat whatever animal laid the eggs, and so eventually turned into egg-eating. 
So Kula was likely a lot more similar to Zitsuyaku or Velocidrome originally, and was probably a specialist nest raider of very young animals, or just small prey in general. Some traits for carnivory are still present, like the enlarged sickle claw on Kula's feet. It's interesting to consider which came first between the egg-eater Kula or the chicken-eater Seregios, and how two nest raiders may have influenced each other's ecology through exploitation competition. Seregios can also just eat Kula too, so that's worth noting. Finally, Kula have a bizarre reproductive system of only having two eggs, and sometimes even each parent's raising a single chick by itself. It's hard to think of this having any real-world parallel, but it is still quite interesting, and also shows a huge level of parental investment that there's a one-to-one -one parent chick ratio. This is again likely due to the sheer amount of information a Kula has to learn about how to navigate such areas, and the reactions and threat levels of each animal it'll have to nest raid, and how best to get around this. After all, it takes a lot to make such a successful thief. As a final point of general discussion, let's make a very basic ranking of the various wyvern families and their intelligence. The dimmest are probably Kezu and Giganox, who are likely effectively just meat robots mainly acting on instinct and innate behaviours. A big step up from this, but still quite dim, are likely the Bloss Wyverns and Gravios, who probably don't have a lot of room for brain in their hugely reinforced skulls, nor exhibit a lot of thinking. Piscine Wyverns may vary a bit, but are probably somewhere roughly around here as well. The next step is probably Brute Wyverns. It's possible Brute Wyverns may be more intelligent than given credit, both overall and by me here, but they rarely get to apply this brain power practically due to being so aggressive. As such, they do seem to be a bit of an angry meathead family overall. It's worth noting too, Devil Joe doesn't actually tool use when he uses another monster to swat at you. The art book states this is just him being unwilling to let go of an already secured meal. The square average likely comes in the form of pseudo wyverns, with Tigrex possibly being the dunce compared to Baryoth and Nagakuga. True flying wyverns are likely a cut above, especially Rathalos. He's shown some quite cunning traits in more recent games, like faking a fireball to goad Zinoga into charging so he can land a better hit. I feel Flying Wyverns as a whole are reasonably intelligent, but Rathalos in general may also be quite bright, and second only really to Bird Wyverns. After, or maybe equal to this, we'd likely have the pack-hunting raptorial Bird Wyverns, and then the Brain Lords themselves, the true Bird Wyverns. I'll probably discuss other families more in later videos, but the various primates and bears are likely very smart too, just because of the animals they're based on. Goss Harag also shows very extensive tool use, and so may well be smarter than the average bear. Leviathans have shown some tool use in Somnicanth, and are based off crocodiles and mustelids, so again they may be above average. The Temnestrans are likely a bit dim though. I add this is purely just my opinion, and based off very scant data. I imagine many of you disagree, and please do comment with your own thoughts, and discuss it among yourselves too. I'm pretty eager to see what you all think. I also will say that Kutku and Garuga will be featuring in their own video considerably later, and both of them are probably quite intelligent too, especially Garuga. So for my various thoughts on the bird boys, I'll break them up. I'm quite fond of Kurapiko, although at the same time I can sort of understand why he hasn't come back for a while. Despite his moveset being quite different to Kutku's, he still feels very similar to him to fight. And with the multiple monsters in the open map often interacting anyway in World and Rise, it would really quite reduce his gimmick of calling them somewhat. But if the franchise ever goes full open world, I feel it would be restored very nicely. And with a good moveset overhaul, I do want him to come back overall. I think he's a very nice designed bird wyvern, and just a pretty cool monster overall. For Gypsaros, it's a lot like Plesioth. I genuinely do like his design, especially how bizarre he is. And his gear too. In fact, his battle axe, sword, and shield was probably the best one in first gen, and still a great one until G rank in second gen too. His fight is an absolute chore though, and one that was barely changed with his return to fourth gen too. I actually think Gypsaros is quite cool as the original swamp monster, and because I'm probably not going to talk about it anywhere else, get ready for a mini TED talk. And that's that we never really got a proper apex level monster for the swamp maps. Bloss Wyverns for the desert, Rathalos for hills and plains, Lagiacrus for coasts. Rathian or Nagakuga for jungle, Gravios for volcano, and Tigrex or Baryoth for the snow. But the swamp has always just had a collection of low tier swamp monsters, and then a high tier monster first implemented for another habitat, and never anything that felt specifically designed for it. It's such a shame as wetlands are such cool environments, with such great potential for unique monsters, and yet I feel in this franchise they've been quite slept on. 
especially because the first gen swamp map and flooded forest in third gen are such fantastic maps, with uniquely low visibility, and the first one especially has such an unbeatable ambience, and a very nice theme too that I'll be using as the outro for this video. Anyway, on to Kula, and I love him. When I first came to World, again I was a bit logged out of the franchise, and I wasn't sure what to expect from this game that looked so unlike old Monster Hunter. When I first saw Kula wandering around the Wild Spire Waste, just living his life, stealing eggs and going about his day, it was almost like a microcosm of everything I hoped Monster Hunter could be. He's also a monster I dislike hunting, as it just feels more than a bit cruel, and often with very poorly justified quests too. And his weapons and armour are a bit crap. But overall he's a wonderful addition, and a starter monster who's just loaded with endearing character. Thanks for watching. As ever, I love all of your comments, please do keep them coming. And I enjoyed the post-episode discussion too. In things I may have missed last week, Adrian Thompson was quite right to point out I completely neglected Green Plesioth. It's tempting to say he has green coloration for rainforest rivers, but this would probably provide little advantage. Such rivers are often opaque brown due to the loads of silt in them, or are clear but dark brown like black tea due to the tannins leached into it. Overall, it's likely they're just like a blue lobster and a rare mutations, and it's probably the same with purple Gypsaros too, as I couldn't really think of any real advantage or difference to him being purple. Badno Tequino did also mention his sleep-inducing toxin, but this is something I struggle to find a real-world analogue to, as whilst various toxins can induce you to become unconscious, this isn't quite the same as something that directly acts as a tranquilizer. If you're a newcomer to my channel, I hope you'll become a subscriber too and thank you to everyone who has already joined. By all means suggest your own ideas or your Monster Hunter theories or make requests. I plan to get through a good chunk of the series roster, so chances are your fave will be covered at some point. I'm also going to warn another delay, and I know I do that almost every week, but it's because I have flexible hours at work and so I never know how busy I'll be. I'll also be swapping from Premiere Pro to Filmora to make these videos, so that may stall things a bit as I learn a new program. The videos may also seem a little bit different, but I don't need something as advanced as Pro to make them. I also like having more money, and Filmora is a fraction of the cost. So next week we'll be taking another trip outside of Monster Hunter, but to Isla Nublar and Sauna respectively, to look into the Jurassic franchise. Why the accuracy of the first film mattered, why Jurassic World was so bad and the Indominus sucks, and can today's truly realistic dinosaurs actually suit Hollywood? It'll still involve a lot of discussion of science, but also its relation to the media as well. So it'll be something new, but something I hope will also be enjoyable and informative and something you'll show up for. And then after that, it is of course back to Monster Hunter, and here's the teaser of who we'll be covering next. <laughs>